All right. Hello, ODT families. We are uh, live and welcome to a lovely Saturday. We're going to give it a second for some people to hop on and then I'm going to be bringing in our guests uh, who I'm super excited to have with me, some of my, my best friends that live across the country. Um, and we're going to get going. So today we're talking uh, tumbling technique and uh, tumbling progression and things like that as we return to the gym. I see people are hopping on. So again, we're talking tumbling technique. Uh, for those of you that are new to ODT uh, and new to kind of the way we train, you're going to be uh, hearing a lot about some of the techniques that we really focus on as well as, and a lot of the things we really focus on are inspired by these two wonderful, wonderful people I'm going to be bringing on here in just a second. Um, so we're going to just kind of have a chat. If you guys want to ask questions throughout, uh, go ahead and type them in the comments and I will get to them as we progress. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, my two great friends, uh, Callie Seitzer and Sean Guzman, and we are going to get right to it. So I'm going to bring them over. So for those of you who haven't met, this is uh, Sean and Callie. Sean and Callie are um, staples at Dream Camps. And they historically have worked with our ODT athletes. Uh, if camp can happen this year, which we're really hoping it does, uh, I think this will be our fourth year uh, having one or both of you out. It might be even our fifth. Um, yeah. And a little known story, Sean and Callie, who are together, met at Dream Camp. So, you know, it's where, it's where uh, amazing things happen. Where dreams are made of. <laughs> yes. um, so uh, Sean is the tumbling director at Top Gun uh, All-Stars, and Callie is the tumbling and stunting and drill extraordinaire. She travels the country teaching at conferences and teaching camps. She also owns a camp uh, company called Inspire Cheer Camps as well. And so she just travels around the world uh, spreading knowledge. So... Uh, we are very lucky to be sitting down with her, and you guys have no idea how lucky you are to have a your own audience with them, uh, chatting with them for a little bit today. So thank you guys for joining us, um, and we're going to get right to it because they're on a limited time frame because believe it or not, everyone wants to talk to them uh, during this break. I, I don't think they've really had as much of a break as some of us have had during the, the coronavirus quarantines. They've been on various podcasts and things talking to people i've seen them doing a lot so um so again thanks you guys and we'll get right to it so i want to start with tumbling progression um and just kind of talking about you know from the from the first time an athlete starts tumbling you know the ideal kind of progression for an athlete to take and and what shortcuts can they take to kind of get to the top because that's where everyone wants to be is throwing foals and double foals and competing at worlds. Um, what are your guys' opinions on, on the proper progression? Uh, well, I'll first start off by saying that there is no such thing as a shortcut when it comes to tumbling. Um, that's one of the reasons why I chose to coach tumbling full time is because it's, it's a process and it's a journey that takes years and years and years to never perfect. You can never really perfect. Um, it's just going through each step, hitting your goal and then, finding another goal to hit and master and repeating that process over and over again. Um, so there really is no shortcut. As far as when it comes to proper progression, even before you start tumbling, I think one of the first thing is to make sure that your body is even capable of doing set movements or even getting put into the set position. So we first have to make sure that our body is flexible enough, mobile enough, and strong enough to even start the process of tumbling because you'll notice as you go through your tumbling career and as you start progressing, those things like mobility, flexibility, um, conditioning will either help you or keep you or inhibit you from your progression. So that's something that people kind of, um, they'll start their journey and they'll, they'll get to certain points and they kind of get stuck at a progression and they don't know why. And a lot of times it just goes back to, you know, square one, are we physically capable of doing set things? So I, I first always want to push that that out there is you got to first make sure that you're physically capable of doing things that you've been asked to do. Once you know that you have the proper flexibility, proper mobility, and you are strong enough, then you want to set yourself up in the progression standpoint, making sure that you're hitting every level and every skill and every level before moving on to the next. 
And we're not looking for just to be able to throw the skill. We're looking at almost a complete mastery of the skill. We want to be able to throw that skill, no questions asked, not even a thought, not even a blink, with almost near perfect technique before moving on to the next. Because what will happen is you'll, you'll get to certain spots in your career where by skipping that progression, it'll catch up to you at some point. So you always want to make sure that you're, you're fulfilling all those requirements before moving on because at some point it will it will catch up to you. Yep. Yeah, well, I was going to say because we can go by skill if we want right now and we can kind of talk about levels if you want to do that. Um, and the progressions that, sh that, are, that are kind of like guidelines I think are really important for some people to know. Um, I know that we all have set progressions in our brain of what we do with our athletes. Um, and what I do across the world, like when I'm setting up my clinics, I, you know, you have to have this skill to get in. So I think maybe if we talk about, you know, per level, what those are, it might be really helpful, um, to understand it. And I know we can start with like level one. There isn't any progression for level one. When you're level one, you are, you're learning. That is where you're learning. So you're, you know, there, of course, progressions for skills of cartwheels, roundups, back walkovers, and front walkovers being back bends and being, you know, handstands and getting all the flexibility exactly what he said before you start doing all that. But um, moving into level two, I feel like for level two, like requirements in level two is, you know, a back walkover and a front walkover to be able to work on a back handspring, a back walkover and front walkover, solid by yourself with great technique, understanding your body lines, um, a great round off, a good cartwheel and a great handstand, I think, which should be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I it definitely is, when you're in that level one, level two stage, that's pretty much going to be the most important building block to set you up for the rest of your skills because, I mean, without a roundup at handspring, everything else you're doing after that, you're, you're kind of putting, you know, two steps forward, but then one step back every time because you're, you're keeping yourself from so many other skills by not mastering those level one and level two skills. It's so important to, to constantly practice those too. I know a lot of level um, six and seven teams that I work with, they still, you know, we still do back walkovers as a warm up because mm -hmm. those are, I mean, it's just important to, to honestly master those because otherwise if you rush through the beginning stages of something or you rush through the beginning stages of a handstand and you don't understand how to hold your body, you are creating habits that that a coach will say something to your athletes over and over and over and over, and it will just it'll just be mind numbing when all we had to do was take a little bit more time in the beginning to strengthen, create a little bit more flexibility, mm -hmm. and practice those lines so you understand your body more going into level two skills um, from level one. So I think I think that's the most important part is people try to get through the level one really fast and they try to get to level two as soon as they can, but the the more that you perfect that, the better you're gonna build throughout mm -hmm. the levels through level two three four five and six and you won't be held back but if you take if you don't take your time it takes for example it would take this long to get a skill if you if you speed through it it could take you know a year to get a skill that would have taken a month if you had all the um correct techniques mm -hmm. and um body lines so but i mean we can still continue on with that level three i i know that i know what i do and you might do something a little different but for sure, if we're going to start training tucks, I always you're required to do standing three back hands rings with increased speed and round off three back hands rings with increased speed and a skill to round off back hand springs um, and showing that you can keep your speed, your lines, and your body control all the way through that before we ever start to do the tuck at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, it's a requirement when I do my clinics because if they don't have three back hand springs, I'm not letting them in my my clinic. It's it's um it would be it would be detrimental to the other kids that I'm coaching. They're not ready for it. Um, I, I, I think the biggest thing too is what you'll notice is the back answering is one of the most difficult skills to perform and perfect. And it's the basis of everything else you do. So you'll notice, especially when it comes from level two to level three, kids try to fast track that, speed through it, or negate the back answering completely and throw, let's say, round off top, round off layout, round off full, and then you'll notice they start to hit plateaus because those angles that you learn out of your round up into your back handspring and the angles you get out of your back handspring into your top is what allows you to throw those bigger skills like fulls and double fulls. So, you know, that level two to level three is where people kind of make or break where they're going to go past level three, you know? I know when I when I teach, I don't teach um, round up tucks or round up layouts or round up fulls or round up doubles at all. Um, before the athlete actually can complete a 
brown up back hamstring back tuck um, by themselves. So we go through that entire process and we learn round up back hamstring back tuck first always because then they'll have enough strength and enough power to be able to do a round up tuck to be able to complete a round up layout. But if you if you do that in the opposite, a lot of times you see that they're not gonna they're not gonna be strong enough for a round up back hamstring tuck, and now it's gonna take longer to learn that. Um, for no reason when actually it's the opposite when you learn a round up against red tuck round up tucks are easy you don't even really have to do a spot the first time that you actually learn it after you learn a round up against red tuck um so that's a that's a big that's a big important thing for me um all the gyms that i consult as well i make sure that like we just i just don't teach round up tucks um at all until we are competing like a level three team it's cool um, and yeah, yeah, and then it's choreo, and then they already have it because the whole team has round of back hands or back tuck, so we're okay. It's not a problem here. Um, and if, if we need to do, like, a longer pass to it, then it's good to have. But um, it just doesn't help in the like, big scheme of things when you're when you're learning. Yeah. I, I think the reason, and one of the reasons why athletes feel so comfortable trying to learn that round of tuck versus the round of back hands or tuck, or they don't want to master that round of back hands or tuck, is because of the angles. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult to understand proper angles and when you're learning a round off tuck, if I can, you know, finish my round off with my feet kind of in front of me, almost under me, it's a lot easier for me to go backwards. But then they start having problems when it comes to, you know, straight lines and layouts, twisting and folds, and getting around in double folds. So and also yeah, it may be learning. easier in that moment, but it, it's it, it's gonna it's gonna catch up to them at some point. Yeah. But you know? where they're learning, so they're learning on like a trampoline yeah. too. A lot of times, athletes don't know how to use a trampoline or a tumble track correctly because it just gains so much power so that they just go, oh, let's just do a round off at the end. And then it's it's one of those things that if you learn the round off back hamstring on a trampoline, if you really learn how to do it right, it trains you how to how to work different angles that you're going to need later anyway, automatically. Um, and you learn your speed changes. You're supposed to have different speeds when you tumble. I feel like some people don't have a, they have one speed and they go either really fast and they can't, mm -hmm. they can't figure out that the tramp does what 80% yeah. of the work. So you have to kind of slow down a little bit. You have to lengthen a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's really valuable to learn on different apparatus like that, but learn it with all the skills involved in it. As long as you have the apparatus to do that. in, of course, I mean, if you, if you think about it, length is easy to teach in theory, power is easy to teach. Angles is where things completely, you know, kids lose that. You know, that's the, yeah. I think the hardest concept to grasp is proper angles, and that's why when you do it in level one and two, it's it's the most difficult too because, hey, angles is hard, and now you're trying to learn those angles when you're first learning how to tumble. It it sometimes makes kids feel like they can't, you know, attack it. Or they 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 don't understand it, so they kind of take that easy approach, but. Catches up to him, and that's only going through level one and two, almost level three. Right. Yeah, you know we're not even about four, five, six, and seven. One and one of the interesting things, and for those of you who wonder why we're oftentimes tired at camp, it's because we can stay up and talk about this stuff for like thirty-two hours. Like you get all of these instructors together, and we just talk uh, theory. But one of the things about those angles that you're talking about is, especially in the round off. To do an appropriate back handspring, you're kind of falling into the skill. You're getting those feet underneath. That takes a lot of strength to block and to snap your feet down. So it's really easy to land with your feet kind of behind you and and not be in a proper position to do a back handspring. It's not scary. You're, you don't have to block as hard. You don't have to snap as hard. But it makes the back handspring not effective. And that's one of the, from my perspective, one of the things I see a lot is people with a a round off with issues and then that just cascades down to everything else they try to do after I, it is a mess you can see like i can see people they get like these are a lot of athletes that i work with you know they'll get they, with a bad round off and a bad back handspring entrance they can get all the way to a tuck with, and then where the problems come in play is when you're doing your layout or even more so in the full and i've seen where athletes when they're doing it right, you learn that full. What I mean, within a couple lessons or within a couple clinics, if you have the correct buildup. If not, it takes so much longer because instead of focusing in on the full and focusing in on just learning that part of it, we have to fix your round off. We have to fix the entrance into your back handspring, the length of your bad habits that have been created over the last however many years it took you to get to level three and four. And now, and now you're working with me, and now I'm making you work on your round off. I'm making you work on your round off for two two lessons three lessons two weeks three weeks mm -hmm. two months because you want that full but it, it takes that right round off back handspring to even come close to doing that full correctly 
And um, I think something that people don't even talk about either, you know, we talk a lot about progression and make it easier to learn. I don't think people really talk about what bad technique does to the body. You know, imagine trying to drive your car with a flat tire for, you know, a year. Eventually something's going to give. So you're, you're, you're keeping your, or you're making yourself more prone to injury and more prone to long-term injury by not having the proper technique. You, you can get many skills. With, you can get through with, it. Yeah, you can get, you can get through many skills with wrong technique. But you'll get stuck somewhere. Yeah, and if it's not stuck in a progression sense, you're going to get stuck in a physical sense. Your body's going to hurt, your back's going to hurt, your knees are going to hurt. Or a mental sense. Or a mental sense, even more Honestly, so, Honestly, yeah. because if you don't have the right technique, you're thinking that you're scared of a skill, but really you don't feel the skill because... It, it can't be thrown from whatever you're doing in the beginning of your yeah. of your build up. S someone once told me if if your skill is taking effort, you're not doing it right. It, it should feel effortless because technique and efficiency is effortless. Kind of like a, uh, I'm gonna use a car again. A really well built car drives with ease. There's no problem with it. If there's a problem there or something's not correct or something's kind of cheap, and I mean by cheap I mean trying to take a an uh, easy approach or, uh, or a skipping little step, skipping yeah. step, yeah, you, it's going to catch up and you're going you're gonna to feel that mental side or that physical side. It's, it's not going to be right. Yeah. Something's going to be something to be wrong. That effortless tumbling is something that is, like when you see it, it's just so, like, obviously Callie's brother, we've all seen him tumble, Mike, and that man, like when I think of effortless tumbling, I think of his tumbling because he literally looks like he's just floating through the skills and... You know, I watch myself tumbling from back in the day, and I was still a tr trained gymnast, and I, I'm like, ooh, gosh, that looks like it hurts, you know? And, yeah, that's – it's so impressive to see someone tumble like that. But really, although it looks effortless, they are, they are trying, but they're firing all those – smaller muscle groups i mean they're still using all their major muscle groups but they're they're tight through their skills their angles are on they're using physics to their advantage um throughout that so habits throughout the time so there's not a lot i know with my brother there's not a lot of bad habits that i've ever seen him do and then even when he even when he is tumbling like say when he did a double his goal was to stick everything he wanted to stick and not move like he started to change his mindset from the big thoughts like angles and length to all right what can i do how long can i set how fast can i block how much can i stick this this pass when your brain's on the little things you've gotten through the great things i think and that's yeah. one of the hard things i feel like for people to understand is I, I think all of us could write down i mean you guys more than me because you're vastly superior tumbling coaches but i mean you guys could probably write three to five pages of all the different things you need to do in a skill to make it perfect and that is a lot. Most tumbling skills happen in less than a second. Yeah. So that's a lot for, for the brain. You can't process all of those things at the same time. You can't think, push through my toes, jump, squeeze, set, do, all of that. By the time you've thought through two of them, you're done. So building those habits so yep. you can think about the little things is so critical. The most important part. And what, what I narrow that down to is I call that conditioning. And people think conditioning is working out, but when you really think about what conditioning is, it's automatic process. So drills for skills condition you to do things without having to think about it. Like you said, skills happen within a second. So you need to be so conditioned at that movement that you don't need to think about it. So that's where conditioning drills and conditioning the body come into play. Because if you can build that muscle memory and that repetition, you know you don't have to have you don't have to think about it so much, and you can just really focus on. You know, the other things like your angles, your pace, your speed, you know, th those variables. You don't want movements to be variables. You want movements to be as specific and precise as possible. Absolutely. And just so you know, Bella is watching from camp, little redhead Bella, and she wants you guys to know she misses you so much. So, um, so yeah, I mean, so you were talking about drills and I think this is, this whole situation has been really interesting from a coaching perspective uh, to be doing virtual classes where kids can't be tumbling on the floor, really. They can't be doing those skills. And seeing the drills that our athletes have been doing and break and seeing some kids come back well, but can you effectively train tumbling without doing the tumbling skill all the time? 
Like, uh, yes, you can because if you're training the pieces of the skills, what you're doing is you're you're having complete mastery, or you're conditioning yourself to understand every aspect of the skill. So, in theory, when you put it all together, you should already know step one, step two, step three of that skill. Now, it does take putting it together. You, know, you, you can't right. you can practice skill without putting it together at some point. You know, but what we're trying to do is limit the amount of times you have to throw that skill. So when you do throw it, you don't miss a beat. So when I and I'm, I was going to go back to another sport because in gymnastics, you, you I mean, at a six hour practice, we're conditioning parts of our skills for four of those hours. Yeah. So I, I started in gymnastics. I was trained by a crazy Russian coach and <laughs> is the reason why I was great at cheerleading. Um, but literally we would be doing, for example, like hip drive and lifts for layouts. I mean, I think I remember doing 50 reps at a time. And let me tell you right now, my hips are stuck in in a layout. They do not come out because we did so many different types of drills on so many different mats, on so many different apparatuses that your body memorizes it. You completely right. memorize it. And you, okay. And the next time you go to throw it, you're like, oh, well, it goes right in. My hips are right in because I did it so many times over here, here, and here that it was just natural. And now it's natural. Like in my adult life, mm -hmm. if I went to throw a layout right now, it'd be exactly the same. It doesn't change. Not once. So I think it's it's very valuable, especially what we've been doing training at home right now. It's so awesome. I've been doing so many virtuals and Zooms and lives and things and working with a lot of athletes and teams. And a lot of athletes are coming back stronger from this virtual training because they were training so much and doing so much conditioning for the skills. So, you know, doing a twisting class, doing a layout class, but doing the conditioning for the skills that they're coming back to the gym and throwing them with ease, easy, because of the conditioning that they did at home in their living room. So it was valuable. It's awesome, actually, I think, what we've just gone through. Right. Not the whole thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and for me, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful to maintain, you know, and realize that they can be doing – when. I mean, how many times as a coach are you told, what can they be working on at home to, to get their skill? And if we say, okay, well, I want them to do this conditioning and this – exercise they're like yeah no, yeah but what can they do to get the tuck and you're like i i just told you what i what mm -hmm. they can do and now we're starting to see because people had no choice but to invest in that concept they're actually starting to see that result yeah i think one of the most important things too because there's actually so much um available knowledge from the coaches in your gym from you know we've done some lives that are just out there right now and zooms mm -hmm. and things like that and what i did as an athlete i don't know what you did but I was very particular about when I got coached or when I was given a drill or conditioning, I write those things down and I keep a list of it so I could refer back to it. Oh, okay. So this is going to be for my layouts and things like that. I used to do that all the time and it really helped me to stay um, more true to it. Mm -hmm. So if I got home, I didn't have to ask somebody, I'd be like, Oh, well I wrote this from, you know, all, all my coaches from before and I had all these lists of things. I mean, I used to list everything out. I have, books and books of things like that because I was so motivated as an athlete I wanted to get better no matter what so any instruction that people told me I literally wrote down after practice and looked at it before I walked back into practice and I feel like I feel like there's so much knowledge right now that was shared in the last two months that you can find conditioning for all types of skills virtually right now um, that you could do at home even if you do go back to gym and you're going back to normal mm -hmm. that you can train every week and and up yourself at home and in the gym. Yeah. So what skills do you guys think, um, skills or techniques, Do you, and we've talked about a few of them, do you think hold people back the most in their in their tumbling progression and developing new skill? And what, what would be things that they people could, you if you could have people work on, that you would have them doing <laughs> regularly? I think anybody that know. knows me and knows my program, they'll know what the answer is, and it's going to be the round off. That's going to be my answer. And the reason is, no matter what skill you're working on, whether it's a back cantering, a tuck, a layout, a double full, a double punch double, a triple back, whatever it is, if you go back and fix your first skill, and the more you fix it, the better the second skill is going to get, the better the third skill is going to get. Because that first skill is what generates power and That's speed. Cool. It's what sets you up for, for anything. So most of the time when we're coaching clinics, you know, they're throwing a double full and they're landing short or something like that. Almost, almost barely do we look mm -hmm. at the double full. 
we automatically go to the round off and go, okay, it's a round off. We got to fix that. And then the backhand swing, of course. But a lot of times the in skill isn't even set up wrong. It's not landing right because of the first skill. And the round off is one of the most important technically sound skills you need to learn correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's where you see most of, the, most of the issues, especially in our sport, because it's a, just a round off. It's just level one, but people speed through it. They don't understand where that round off is going to go. That round off is eventually going to go to a double fold. You know, not so, only that, it's going to come out of an Arabian. Mm -hmm. It's going to come out of a punch run. If you don't, if you don't know how to generate power from your own body, and that means without the run, if you don't know how to do your blocking correctly and use your angles correctly, you're not going to be able to consistently throw, you know, a punch run through the double. You'll be able to throw it once or twice, but consistent means ten times in a row you don't change it. It doesn't change. I, I, I there's been plenty of times, and I've had the opportunity. Of, I'm lucky enough that I get to work for um, an amazing talent coach, Victor. And there's been plenty of times where I'll be in the gym and I'll be like, hey, Coach Victor, I don't know what's going on. Can you, can you see them? And he goes, just look at the round off. And I'm like, oh, well, I get right, look at the round off. What are, well, oh man, I gotta go back to the drawing board. So you have to be able to take a step back from those big skills and look at the smaller skills. So in my opinion, the round off is what I'd tell everyone to work. Mine too, for sure. <laughs> but there's, I guess, two others that we should definitely talk about. One that people get stuck on, or this is the one they fly through. Like when you get your backhand spring, boom, mm -hmm. move on to two and three and four and whatever, and like you're moving on from there. And your backhand spring to get it technically sound takes almost as long as the round off, I would say, <laughs> because and and it takes patience. That's with the backhand spring, you have to be patient and you have to want want the like two back answers three back answers for be able to consistently do that amount and do it with great speed and great length i feel like everybody you'll get a back answering and then okay great i'm ready to go to the next thing what's the next thing let's do it okay two back answerings but i didn't perfect my one yet but i'm going to add a second one to it so now they're short they're undercut they're slow bent knees bent arms and we didn't perfect that first one before we learned the second one and now we're on this path of you're going to take things, things are going to take longer to learn is, is what it is. And that's, you're ultimately trying to learn at, at a quick rate. I know cheerleading is trying to like, let's move really fast. But if you take a little bit more time on the lower level skills, like the round off and the back handstring, and I was going to say handstand too. I need to so say handstand. Yeah. I love handstands, but, but honestly, it's if you, though. if you can hold a 30 second handstand without moving, or if you can walk the floor on your hands, I automatically go, well, I know that kick can tumble. I know that because a handstand to do it correctly, you've got to hold your body line in the same way that you have to base, that you have to do a layout, that you have to throw a back handspring, that you have to push a round off, that you have to do a, like it's in every single skill. But a lot of people rush through that skill too and they don't take the, you know, they don't they don't make it like a, important, it's just a pass through skill. We're getting to the next skill. Yep. But if you can't a handstand without moving your hands, like for, I mean, I would say, 15 to 30 seconds, your body control isn't there yet. Like it's not, and no, no cheerleaders can. I'm just being honest with that. Like there's not a lot of cheerleaders that can do that. But if you could, you'd be above everybody else. I would tell you that right now because it is so important. It's in everything we do. It's in a basket toss. It's in all parts of cheerleading, right? Yeah. So if you think about it, handstand, pre-level one. Round off, level, that came from level two. Those are the three things that you heard from us that are probably the most important and need to be worked on the most. And if you're like a level five, six, you know, seven athlete, you're still doing those skills. Mm -hmm. You're still warming those skills up. You're still training those skills up. Like I know personally, I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, I don't know what you did, but every single time I had to, you know, I competed till I was. No, oh, just kidding. I competed this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, you did. I was thirty. <laughs> but even so, like when I was tumbling, you know, I threw, I threw crazy skills, maybe into doubles and whatever. Like, but I always warmed up, round up. Back handspring, round off two back, round off three back handsprings. Every time I did round off three back handsprings, almost every time. That's unheard of. Most people, when you have a double, you're not going to do a round off three back handsprings ever again. But why not? See, I I learned the hard way. I am every coach's worst nightmare, and it's the reason why I coach the way I do is because I know the side effects of doing things a certain way. So I wasn't the one that went through progressions. I was the okay. I'm gonna throw a rebound and then I'm gonna throw a double fold. I'm not going to do a handstand. I'm probably not going to stretch my shoulders that much. And it caught up to me. 
you know. Now I, we're stretching your shoulders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm dealing with the throat on that. <laughs> so, but, so you you have to make sure that you're doing everything possible to have longevity in the sport, have longevity with good technique in the sport, and set yourself up to be able to progress. You know, I think ultimately is what you're trying to do as an athlete. You know, longevity, longevity with good technique and being able to progress to your fullest potential. You know what, you know what I think with cheerleading too is the, the most difficult part is I think there's a big misconception in cheerleading where, you know, you're you're on a tiny team, then you're on a mini team, then you're on a level one team, then the next year you're level two, next mm -hmm. year you're level three. That's not realistic. It's just right. not. It's not realistic stunting-wise, basket toss-wise, and absolutely not tumbling wise like it's it that is where the misconception mm -hmm. is you don't move up every year there's certain athletes that do and that's fantastic with some athletes that just fly through things like that and they they do it well and they do it with good technique but m majority of athletes don't you're going to be working those level one skills for longer than a year you're going to be working those level two skills mm -hmm. level two for sure for a couple years you know i think that's the hardest part is is i think uh, athletes expect like I'm going to move, you know, in seven years, I'm level seven. That's just not real. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially if you're dealing with all aspects of the sport, you know, you can get really good at one aspect of the sport, but how many other parts of the sport are you letting go to the wayside because you're trying to get so good at this? So you're, you're trying to become the best tumbler you can, but how's your stunting? You know, how's your flying abilities? How's your jumping abilities, your dancing abilities? So if you want to be well-versed and be the best athlete on your team, it requires time because you're trying to get good at all these different aspects of the sport, you know? Yeah. That's why if you, if you look at basketball, you're not a great shooter. You know, you want to try to be as well-rounded as you can be. You have your specialties here and there, but you're going to be as well-rounded as you can. You want to be able to shoot, steal the ball. You want to be able to block. You want to do all of it, you know? Yeah, you don't want to be one-dimensional. Yeah. Why are you one-dimensional? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, you guys said a couple things that really relate to how some of the things we do with training. And, and Callie, I'm with you on the handstand. You know, my first virtual class I did during this, I made it was an advanced class, and I was like, all right, uh, we're going to do handstands. And then I started doing pirouettes, and literally no one could do a pirouette, like even a half pirouette. And I was like, <laughs> and these are kids who are trying to throw foals and double foals. And I'm like, you, you can't do a handstand pirouette, but you want to leave your hands and twist twice and then land on your feet, you know. Like if you don't have the strength and the air awareness to hold that position and twist on your hands, that's identifying a, a short shortage there. And then Sean, you were talking with round offs and, and power. And that's actually why a lot of people don't understand in our program, we do a lot of training from a power hurdle. And like when we assess athletes, when we're looking at their skills, generally speaking, we, it, you don't have it. Like you don't have a full, if you can't do it from a power hurdle, like if you have to yeah. run five steps, then there's something else wrong. You're, you're building momentum from your run, which is making up for issues. Um, yep. And that, that's something that's a little bit weird for some people when they first come over to our program. They're like, well, why? They don't understand that. But it's, I mean, that's the impetus, right? They have, there's something wrong and they're hiding it with a run. Just like yeah. you watch boys tumble and they may be able to throw a double full, but they have bad technique. They're just getting away with it because genetically they have a little bit more fast twitch muscle fiber so they're forcing it through as opposed to like using good technique when I, I, again going back to the round off you know you can run all you want you can take you know a mile sprint and then do a round off but ultimately what's the job of the round off the job of the round off is to change the direction of the power from forward facing to backward facing so if you're not doing that correctly, you're not efficiently changing your power to go backwards. So run all you want, but you're, you're gassing yourself up for no reason. Right. You know? I, that's exactly, that's why I teach, like, I teach not just power hurdles, I teach, I teach knee round offs, yeah. I teach yeah. no knee step round offs, because you, your body generates the power. What you do with your body and how you use your body lines generates power. If you have to do the run like that, I was just working with an athlete this, like, this couple of weeks, and it was a it was a mind blowing moment because she could run and do a punch run through to double, but then when I made her do a two step punch front, she couldn't even do a round back handspring out of it. 
And we really worked on blocking drills. We worked on core control. We worked on her angles and using her angles with her snap down um, constantly. And now she can actually do a two step double, which before she was running five steps into it and couldn't do it, could barely do a full out of a two step. Um, and it, it just, it, you're right. What you said is so right. It, it's masking, mm -hmm. it's masking what you're doing with your body. And if you actually know how to use your body to generate power, um, that's, that's a good way to put that actually. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, so I, you guys are a little bit more fortunate than us in that you're in Florida and your governor is like, all you sports, let's go. Um, we're <laughs> just starting to get back into the gym. Like, uh, Tuesday will be our first uh, training camps and we have to do them in like camp settings and we can only tumble um, or a tumble condition jump but any stuff with social distancing so mm -hmm. as as athletes return to tumbling return to training I, I shortened it to the RTT um, return to training program um, what is what are important considerations in terms of pacing, like how much they should be throwing skills, their safety, and then focus on conditioning? Yeah, I think taking it slow is really important. Um, I think taking it slow is really important, especially well, in Florida. I mean, it's hot here too. So I think, I just think it's important that they ease back into it because we haven't had two months off in this sport in Ever. Ever. <laughs> Never. Never. This, I don't think this sport, since I started 20 years ago, I don't think the sport has ever had more than two weeks. maybe two weeks off. Yeah. In between, you know, I think back in the day, it used to be like a month between your last competition and tryouts. I think, and I'm talking back like, you know, 15 years ago. So this whole month or two months off, you have to understand that the timing will be a little bit off, your flexibility will be a little bit off. Your, your muscles atrophied a bit, taking into consideration that you may have just sat down the entire two months, you know? So you have to take into, to those, take those things into account. And what I did, I had a lesson for the first time on Wednesday. And what I did with her was I just started at level one and we just worked our way up. And when we got to a point where her technique was, you know, faulting just a bit, we stopped there, you know, and, and, that just kind of gave me, I just kind of noticed, okay, where they're at, where their body is, are they capable of doing certain things? Okay, let's not push it because I see this is happening in this skill, this is happening in this skill. I can almost assume it's going to happen in the hardest skills. So I think that's going to help with injury prevention too, mm -hmm. but the hardest part is controlling the mind of an athlete because you're going to get an athlete that's just dying, dying to get off the grass and get in this gym and they're going to want to throw all their skills right when they come in. And I think it's so important for the coach to to gradually, exactly what you just said, gradually, like, let's start at the basics and say say you threw double foals, you know, you got your double foal right before the time, you know, COVID-19 happened. Well, we're not just going to come in and chunk it the first day. We're not doing that. Like, we're, we need to build back up. We need to see where your strength is. We need to see where your power is. We need to see where your mental is. Like, mental is so important to build up to that. If you just jump, that can create a fear that will never go away. So yeah. I think. That build is so important. I was just, I was talking to a friend uh, at another gym and they were running tryouts, not local, and I'm not going to dime their gym out, but they had an athlete come in, level six kid, and threw a whip double, got lost, crashed and burned, broke their collarbone. And I mean, it was their first day back in the gym. Like, you don't need to throw a whip double, you know, or you, you don't need to be pushing to your, your highest level skills on day one. You know, take your time, get there. Um, but. Smart. What would you guys say if you were to, and I'm, I'm putting them on the spot, everyone. We ha they haven't been told that I was going to ask them for mathematics in this. But like if you were to divide like say a percentage of training time, um, if you had 100% of your time, what percentage would you dedicate to, to basics, especially right now as we're returning, to basics, to actually developing new skill and to just general strength and conditioning? I think we're, we're in the summer, so this is where, you know, you're starting out again. So I think basics are really important. I, I'm not sure I have percentages in my mind, but, you know, we're in the summer. This is where you start your build. So you make the team per the skills you have, of course, but you're going to build the technique and progressions for a good amount of time right mm -hmm. now, for months at a time. So I don't know if you have percentages in I, right now. If I would break up, like, let's say a normal tumbling class, I would say, you know, 
spend 30 to 40% of your time warming up and doing progressions. You know, spend maybe 20 to 30% actually tumbling and going through the skills prior to your highest level skills and then spend the other 40% conditioning. You know, again, these are just, I'm not very good at yeah. math. I'm just, <laughs> just throwing numbers out there. But we want to try to get where our warm up and our progression and our conditioning is over beating our time tumbling. And if it was in a practice, I think, um, especially like in the summer, and this is before we ever had COVID-19, like you're doing maybe a two hour practice, an hour of that should be conditioning and progressions mm -hmm. of the skills that you're working on, especially if it's tumbling. So conditioning for a good amount of the practices in the summer is really important yeah. um, just to build the strength and to also assess where the athlete is. Like, especially after a two month break, we've never had that. So it would it would be important to assess where they're at by challenging them mm -hmm. conditioning wise and through the progressions to see how they can handle things, you know, because you don't you don't want to get them, you know, working doing all those progressions doing all that stuff and then they get to the hard stuff and they're they're gassed. Like it's a it's a gradual build I feel like right now in the summer where conditioning's most important, progressions are in all all aspects, you know, baskets, stunts and tumbling um, is a major focus for the next three months. I, right. I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that when it comes back to tumbling, if you are if you had skills and you're proficient at those skills prior to a long break, you're not going to have a loss of technique, you're going to have a loss of strength mm -hmm. and a loss of um, firing, muscle firing. But your technique is still there. It's like riding a bike. And look, I, I haven't tumbled in years. I can still go to the tumble track and throw a double full. Can I go to the floor and do it? Probably not. My strength isn't there. My my time isn't there, but it'll get there. So I think if you realize that your techniques, you're not going to lose your technique. It's like riding a bike. What you will lose is the ability to throw that technique. You know, the, the, the physical capability to do it. So if you can keep your physical capabilities up and get it back to a point where it was, you'll notice skills are right there, you know? I've always noticed as, you know, as we all get older and we tumble less and less and less and I'm, I'm, old and broken down. I think one of the things I always notice that I've lost a lot of is air awareness. The longer I go without tumbling, like that, that knowledge and processing of where I'm at when I'm upside down becomes more challenging. And, but I think that where, where people don't realize is you can still gather that back by doing basic level skills. Like if you're a level five kid doing tucks and layouts is building that air awareness and, and getting that back. You don't have to double necessarily yeah. to, to rebuild it. Um, so a lot of the people we have watching, I know you guys got to go, so I'm going to let you go here in a second. But um, a lot of the people we have watching are are all parents in our program or even a few athletes. Um, and I think kind of what I hear you saying in terms of the percentages and training and it's being summer is like parents should be prepared for their athlete to get out of practice and not avoid doing the like, hey, did you throw your full tonight when it's a new skill? Mm -hmm. It, because they might say no, and that doesn't mean that they're not progressing, right? Yeah. It, it, they may be doing drills for it. They may be training, like, the, the body control. I feel like body control is so important in the summer, and, and if you train it right, you're set up to do whatever your choreo mm -hmm. choreographer throws at you. Um, so I, I definitely, I, yeah. And for parents who don't understand what it's like, I, I equate it to working out, you know. You may have been able to squat 300 pounds, if you take two months off, you can't come back and squat 300 pounds. So just change the 300 pounds for a full or for a double full. You know, you you work so hard to get to that double full. You take two months off. It's going to take you some time to get back to it. Not as long as it did before. Right. Your body knows what to do, but it's going to take time for you to get back to it. So, you know, I think that's kind of an easier way to or an easier analogy for parents who don't know what it's like to tumble to understand, you know, I think we've all tried to work out at some point in our life and we know what it's like. It's difficult. It's hard. You know, you, you get to a certain weight you're lifting or you get to a certain size you're trying to get to. It, it's tough. You know, you drop off, but it's a little bit easier to come back the next time. It's a little bit easier to come back the next time. So you, you got to give your athletes that grace period to get them back into it. You know, if not, you're just setting them up for injury and for failure. And I think it's like being able to just trust the process too. Like understand that, that it is a process that, you know, in the summer months we train a certain way. When we get to choreography, we train a certain way. When we get to the season, we're training a different way. And it's a process. 
And if you trust that process and athletes and parents alike, if you trust how that process is going, you realize that it's a lot better to support the process for your athlete and actually talk to the athlete about the process and say, that's the most important part. It's the journey to what you're getting to. Um, and in the summer, it, it, it is important to have a longer process to get to your bigger skills because it will produce better on the floor mm -hmm. when we get into season. Yeah. And, and I think some people who are new to at least our program, people who've been in our program, they know, and we're not even as intense as they do it at Top Gun, but we work basics every summer. That is just a part of summer training. It's just probably going to be a little bit amplified in almost every program as we return to, to trying to train this stuff. It's going to be almost more focus on basics. You know, you might see it more more time doing that, more time conditioning and building the flexibility and the strength because some athletes killed it, did every virtual class they could. They absorbed all that information. They did every single thing. And some maybe weren't mentally in the space where they were doing that as much, but they're ready to get back to it. And we have to we have to cater to all those different people and make sure that they're all training and progressing efficiently. So while you may see your kid get out there and and bust their skills out and, and feel great. There may be other kids who only did, you know, five virtual classes and conditioned once a week and they're not as ready. So, you know, that's one of the challenges of managing a gym and those kind of things is athletes at all different um, points in their progression. Making sure it's safe, yeah. like all around and, and doing a safe build for everybody, even if they're on different levels. Um, and mentally safe. That's the thing I've been talking about so much more is like your mental build is almost more important than just the physical build because if you do skip all that or say we take these two months off and then we throw right in, that can cause things in your mind and to, to be where you, you've created a fear for no reason because we didn't, we didn't take our time because we didn't progress through the progressions correctly. So mental build is so important, especially after this COVID-19 right now. I think it's one of the most important things that we need to focus on is proper mental build and progressions to help your mental be strong and stay tough all the way through. Well, I, I completely agree. We could probably talk for hours more, but I know you guys uh, also are a part of Matt talk and you're, I think you have a, a conversation coming up here in like a couple minutes. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a, uh, a conditioning talk with, uh, three other industry professionals that are super knowledgeable in that regard. We have a, current uh, collegiate gymnastics coach. We have a current all-star cheerleading coach and we have an ex all-star cheerleading coach and an ex gymnast who um, kind of did more of the fitness route. So we'll have a good, a good panel on there. Are those, you not conditioning? Yeah. Those are not <laughs> live streamed. Those are uploaded later, correct? That chat. Yeah. yeah. It's Matt chat. We have Matt uh, chat. three of them out so far. And they're uh, on YouTube. Yep, yep. They're on YouTube, they're on Facebook. I have one on Mental Blocks. Yeah, she has one on Mental Blocks that just happened. Um, we had one two weeks ago on tryouts. Team Place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. tryouts. Uh, and that was a great talk with some great industry professionals. And then our first one was the pilot episode. We have a uh, spotting versus drilling coming out, and we have conditioning, and we have tumbling classes versus privates versus team tumbling. So we have a lot of things coming out your way. And not all of that relates to our parents, but you know, if they're looking for content to listen to, um, I think the conditioning one might actually be really good when that one comes out for everyone to hear. So again, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, we miss you a lot. I'm fingers triple crossed that camp and everything is able to get approved because we all need our time in the woods. Um, and yeah, we will, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much for your time. Guys soon, uh, thank you guys. See you guys. Yeah. Bye guys. Oh, and here comes Tori. Hey! <laughs>